My name is Liren Chu. I'm the president of the Canadian Research Institute of Spirituality and Healing. And I would like to thank you and welcome you for coming to this event. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Elfie Lango. Our speaker tonight entitled his presentation, Meaning from a life of inner consent to a detection of spirituality. He will explore Victor Frankl's concept of a meaningful life and the theoretical perspective of existential analysis. And he will also share with us about um, his, some of his insight on how to manage the question of meaning both personally and professionally. Dr. Lango was born in Austria in 1951 and graduated from University of in Innsbruck, Innsbruck and Vienna, mm -hmm. um, Rome, Rome, and Toulouse, yeah. and Vienna. It's very well, foreign it's to me <laughs> because I've never been there. And <laughs> He is a friend and partner of Victor Frankl. And with a background in medicine and psychology, he has been practicing general medicine, psychiatry, and psychotherapy for far more than three decades altogether. And he's a professor of psych psychotherapy at Moscow HSE University. And President and co founder of International Society for Logotherapy and Existential Analysis, and the vice president of the International Federation of Psychotherapy. And he, published, he has published more than 200 books and papers. So please help me welcome Dr. Alfred Lango. Lirin, my dear guests, uh, and for this evening, I'm really moved what you knew by heart, talk, <laughs> telling about me. It's incredible. I would have to reflect on it, <laughs> but you spoke it so easily, talked about it so easily. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here, and I... Uh, I'm on a tour through North America coming from Mexico and leaving to Austria at the end of this week. And I'm really honored to be with you this evening. It's my first uh, public talk in, in Vancouver. And uh, so this is quite uh, a new thing for me. And I hope we will have a, good, a great evening and a good talk together after the presentation. Well. Um, I would like to start uh, to take you a little bit with me to the origins of these thoughts uh, and this presentation and to take you to a journey to Vienna. And I must say, I had to, to stay very close to Lirin before when, when she was talking because I had the micro on, my <laughs> on me. So she, we, we, it was not my obsessive uh, attitude. <laughs> Okay, let's go through a walk, for a walk through Vienna. This is part of uh, the, um, the castle of the emperor in the city. The summer residence, uh, part of the summer residence of uh, Vienna, Schönbrunn, very close where I'm living. I, I see this part every day when I'm at home. In the cathedral, St. Stephen's, a monument for Mozart. And accidentally, when my daughter was taking this picture, there was a chorus, a choir, of, uh, choir a choir with, where, who were, which was taking pictures for their new CD. <laughs> so I have not the CD here, but <laughs> a part of this monument of Mozart. 
The other side of Vienna, a monument for the Holocaust. You see here underneath a, a person, a man who is washing the, the um, street with his toothbrush. Uh, he was Jewish. And this was made happen to Jewish people in Vienna at that time. The university with very famous heads. <laughs> On this side is the head of uh, Sigmund Freud. And this is the house of Sigmund Freud. He lived in the second story. And this is the house of Viktor Frankl, who also lived here in the second story. His image, Viktor Frankl, and his famous book on man's search for meaning, this book on his experience in concentration camp. A very well-known book, especially in North America. Well, let's now start with the theme, which was the main theme in the life of Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was uh, dedicated to the, the discovery and to the treatment of, um, to the discovery of meaning and treatment of meaning loss throughout his life. He, once he was asked uh, what is the meaning of his life, and then uh, he didn't answer, but somebody in the public answered, and from then on, Frankl was citing this person throughout his life. He was, this in, the person in the public was answering, for you it's certainly the meaning of life consisted in helping people to find meaning. And then he nodded and said, well, it, it cannot be said in a better way. Well, why at all do we ask for meaning? This is a big question in our life. Meaning is, uh, is, is this the symptom of something which is lacking, like uh, a lack of belief, of religion, of faith? Or is it a symptom of psychological problems, of psychopathology? Or is it just philosophical interest which is innate in human nature, so that at least some of us think about it consciously. I would say it is all together. We can bring this existential question uh, into, to, to, or to summarize this existential question, the background of this existential question, uh, by saying that something is doesn't fit well. When something doesn't fit well, we are looking for a, a context, a connection. And this is standing behind the quest for meaning. When my life, for instance, uh, goes a wrong direction, then the question of meaning is coming up in relationship, in profession, when I don't have the feeling that this is good, how it goes, then I'm, the question of meaning is awakening in me. Or if something essential is missing in my life, love, relationship, <laughs> religion, whatever, then the question of meaning is awakening again. Or if all together is not as it should be, by content or quality of life, if this is in danger, then the direction the life is going is not good. And this brings me to the question, why am I doing this? Shall I continue that way? Is this a good way to, to live? So the question for meaning is the question for what Am I living? For what am I doing this? For what am I living in general? And for what am I doing coming? Am I coming tonight here to listen? For what am I suffering this uh, 
headache, this cancer. The quest for meaning, the quest for purpose and meaning of life reflects our need of orientation and our longing of affiliation. We need orientation about the direction of the life in general and of my life in concrete. So, we, um, the quest for meaning is something arising from a, a deeper essence we have to have a look at. We are lit, let us start uh, this entrance to meaning by a question about the legitimate sources of knowledge about these fundamental this fundamental question of Dasein. There are different levels of recognition. There is an external source of knowledge and an internal source of, no uh, source of knowledge. The external source of knowledge is usually um, answered or or given by religion and philosophy. The, any religion brings a kind of divine revelation of meaning of life. This is the strength of, of a religion. It gives it grow, uh, a great orientation in life. And the philosophy, philosophical understanding of meaning takes knowledge from the logical structure of how things are interrelated. So, in philosophy we also think about possible meanings of life. But there is another source of knowledge, the one we have inside ourselves. We have, we, we by ourselves, we have knowledge about what can be meaning for my life. This is the own experience of life from which we detract a feeling, a knowledge, a, a perception if this leads to a good end or not how I behave and what I do. My own experience is giving me orientation. Normally if I feel well, if I feel happy, if I feel fulfilled, then I would say, yes, this, in, in this way my life may continue and then I feel meaning. I see meaning, I am living meaning. Reflecting upon it or not, it does not depend. The feeling that my life is okay, that I may continue that way, is the existentially felt meaning of existence. The <coughs> Normally, in tradition, the answers to the, the treatment of the meaning question was, has been done in religion and for, some, for a few people in philosophy. But a part of this, the individual problems of meaning uh, are also accompanied by a suffering and this also needs a psychological treatment. So psychology is also um, asked to help for the suffering of meaninglessness. Well, when do we have problems with meaning? There are different layers of problems of meaning which correspond to the two sources of uh, knowledge about meaning. Let us begin with the first, with the most general aspects of um, lack of meaning, of when problems of meaning arise. We can combine or, or connect this, um, the lack of meaning with an anthropological issue. Viktor Frankl once described this great horizon of how the, the lack of meaning comes up or, or came up in history, in human history. I would like to say, to cite Viktor Frankl on this occasion. He writes, Should I briefly go into the reasons why, which may underlie the existential vacuum 
The existential vacuum is a feeling of inner void and emptiness and constant meaninglessness. Existentially void. The reasons which may underlie the existential vacuum, then they could be traced back to two reasons, frankly saying. To the loss of instincts and to the loss of traditions. On the contrary, to the animal, there are no instincts which tell human beings what they must do. And the persons of today, no traditions tell what they ought to do. And thus, they often seem to ignore what they really want, not knowing and to, to resume, to, um, to summarize it, not knowing what we must do by instincts or what we ought to do by traditions. We don't know what we want to do. As a consequence, they strive even more to want only what others do or to do only what the others want. They strive um, they strive even more to want only what others do or to do only what the others want. This means to copy or to obey, to copy others. In the first case, we are confronted with the conformism and in the latter with totalitarianism, which is still a danger in, in the world and which is still present in the world. Conformism, all the the modes which are going on, the, the um, that one modern fashions, all the, we follow the fashionable, and uh, we copy others. And totalitarianism is uh, a danger which is uh, has been very present in the last century, in communism, in in Europe, in the Nazi during Nazi time, and it is still around the world in many continents. Well, which fr what Frankly explains in this uh, short cit uh, citation uh, means that we are much more referred to ourselves now than in other generations. That we need our own perception and feelings to know what it is all about in our life. And we have to find our decisions and our responsibilities. We seem to have this potentiality, but are we really trained to live it? To come to terms with one's own will and orientation in life is a central demand for us. The, as a complex procedure, it can easily lead to an over-demanding challenge which is simply too much for an individual. So it can result in to um, reactive behavior like a fanatic behavior. In fanatism, I am convinced about what is meaningful and I am so convinced that uh, like in a, in a paranoid manner that I don't, I, that I'm no more open for any dialogue or any correction in it. So fanatism is replacing a lack of meaning. We may understand a lot of this dynamic in people who suffer from meaningless, who, or who used to suffer and then got fanatic. Or uh, the other, another reactive behavior to it is the, uh, a too much adaptive behavior in relationships, in families, in firms, in societies, um, that we adapt and give up, give up our own position. But why at all do we need meaning? Do animals suffer from, meaning, from meaninglessness? The reason why we need meaning is uh, the, that we are spiritual beings. As spiritual beings, we want to understand the meaning of the situation, the meaning why, why we have to do something, 
why we have to suffer something. Or the meaning of this evening. It, the context in which stands a single activity or a, uh, something I, I experience. What, are, what makes sense? This is bringing it into a context. The spiritual need for meaning is rooted in the human dimension of having a mental power. It is an anthropological power of being able to perceive and understand a reason, a logos, a regularity. And this power is combined with an author spiritual capacity, the human freedom, the capacity to decide. So for decisions, we need understanding. We need a context which makes, it, which makes the sense and allows me to make a decision which corresponds to my essence, to my spiritual being. So asking for meaning is a, a, has a correspondence to one's own essence. We are, the, the question of meaning is a mirror of our structure and is not a sickness, as Sigmund Freud was saying. Freud was putting the question for meaning into, into the frame of pathology, saying that whoever is asking for meaning has, is suffering from a sickness. It is a symptom of a sickness in every case. Against this notion, Frankl was standing up and saying that this is not true. Asking for meaning is a truly human question. We need meaning for orientation. We will see what will be possible meanings later on. So the quest for meaning is uh, also a question of, or a symbol of dignity, of human dignity. It corresponds to understand what we, uh, what we, are, do, what we are doing. We have to feel our being in its value. And we feel our being here as valuable. And therefore, it's, it is important what we do and why we do something. And, this give, and for this, we need an orientation. This means the searching for meaning is uh, take the human liberty serious. Meaning means bringing our liberty into a reliable relationship to experiential life, experienced life. Only those psychotherapies which consider the dignity and liberty of the person are explicitly dealing with meaning. The other situations which claim for meaning is not only the anthropological situation and the fact that we are spiritual in our liberty and in our need for understanding and making decisions, but that we are also suffering from uh, harm and damages and losses. And when we don't understand why we have to, to suffer, this makes, produces despair. When we are incurably ill, we want to understand personally why we should undergo this sickness and carry it. And then meaning becomes sometimes a burning quality, a problem which leads, peop which leads people close to suicide or even into it. So meaning is a, a very, uh, uh, an issue, with, uh, a very important issue in life. Because when we don't see a meaning or a reason, why suffer? For what? I, I would like to tell you here the story of uh, parents uh, who lost their daughter and suffered from meaninglessness. Helga, the daughter of, uh, in, in this family, 
um, was about to celebrate her 21st birthday. She went out to see some friends for some preparations and it was in the winter time, uh, a few days uh, before Christmas. And uh, on her way back, she got into a skip while it was starting to snow and she crashed into a tree. She was dead at that moment. moment. But her parents, they didn't know why they should continue to, life, to live. For the half year since, their life was only suffering. What for are we living, was their question. They were say, saying sentences like, our life can never be happy again, it's only suffering. We lost our love, our hope, our future. Our, li our life lost its meaning that very day. These are events which can happen to everybody. Unprepared, we are confronted with an extreme situation of life and we don't understand what happened and why it happened and how we can deal with it and how we can continue and if this has meaning at all. And this is much more than a philosophical question when it happens. This is so burning and so despairing if we, we can't see any way, any productive way, any way which leads to a good end in such a situation. And it may not be an accident of a child. There are many other possibilities which may happen. Existence is, is um, insecure and may break down in every moment as we are mortal in every moment, not only at the end of our life. These poor parents lost their most important value of their life and they suffered from a lack of orientation and a content in their life and the loss of their future. The, fu the future seemed to be empty. Interestingly enough, the fact that they had another, do another daughter was only of little help for the mother, but not for the father. And it is cl uh, clear, one cannot exchange a love with another love. Sure, they needed more time for mourning. A half a year is not enough. But the problem was, that uh, after a half a year, they didn't want to cry anymore. They were so tired about mourning. They needed spiritual nourishment, but their religion didn't help them. They were in struggle with God. What they needed in this situation was to connect themselves to their daughter, to hold her alive spiritually in their own lives. How can we help them in this, psychologically. They were suffering also for the fact that the daughter had to die so young. What meaning did her life have? Did she live in vain, not having been able to fulfill her life's meaning? The thoughts of the parents went around these reflections as it turned out. So we elaborated with great pain for the parents, what Helga was living for. And it came out that she loved flowers. And that she always brought flowers in, in the house and decorated it. And now no one is doing it anymore. And the house was so empty, so dead. She also loved to make people happy by little things, by talking, smiling, small presents. And so she, and this also was missing in the family, in the, in the, uh, in the midst of the uh, friends she had. The question came up if the parents, if, if uh, the parents couldn't take over 
her meaning and thus continue one essential of her life on a spiritual level? Couldn't they pick up flowers for her every day or second and smile for her to their daughter, to their neighbors, to their friends? and do what Helga did before. Wouldn't they feel close to her by doing this? Wouldn't they feel her breathing in this action? This was the turning point in their suffering life. It needed some time to start with, slowly. But finally, Helga's father was also able to begin with this hurting attitude of renouncing for more and to, to start to do a little bit, a little thing of what was remaining. They could live in the spirit of Helga and so take her alive spiritually for her and make visible their, her presence. So Helga continued in a way to live through them. Meaning is something which has a lot of power. It strengthens, it strengthens our soul, our will, our motivation, our spiritual power to resist and therefore meaning has an existential significance. Frankl liked to cite Nietzsche to underline this existential relevance of meaning. Nietzsche was saying, who has a why to live for endures almost anyhow. When we know for what it may be of value, what we are doing, when we feel that and or believe, and or believe in a meaning, then it may mobilize a despite which, with which we are enabled to, resist, in, enabled to resist difficult life situations. Meaning, therefore, is not only important for the value of life, but it is an essential ingredient for the overcoming difficult situation, situations. Frankl was uh, calling it not only a value of life, but a survival value. Frankl was living in concentration camps and he knew that what he was speaking about. And he knew and has seen how people survived in concentration camps. Those who gave up or lost their meaning got very quickly sick or committed suicide. The quest for meaning in the daily life is we can consider meaning as something which almost everybody knows. But not everybody is thinking consciously about, the, about meaning. How can we explain that? In an investigation which was done by colleagues of mine in Vienna, um, people, it was 160 people who was investigated. All of these, 96% uh, 90, of these were indicating that they have been confronted with the question of meaning in their life. They know about it. But um, some of them, about 10% of them, uh, and from this we can take that the question of meaning is common, very common. It is an inevitable question in human life. But about 10% of these people indicated that they normally in their everyday life don't think about meaning. They don't even care about meaning. And in the questionnaire which they had to fill out, these 10% of people showed to have the highest score of meaning. Those who don't care about meaning have the highest core of meaning. How can we explain this? It is something which Frankl was uh, talking about 
during his life so many times. It is obvious those who live meaningfully, who are in the midst of meaning, don't ask for meaning. It is natural, obvious for them to what, what is meaning. And Frankl was taking um, examples like when you are happy in love and you are asked, do you think your life has meaning? Then you are perplexed about this question. But this it doesn't fit to the, to the actual life situation. Or when you listen to music in a concert and you are taken away by the music and your neighbor is asking you, your, do you think your life has meaning? <laughs> so one feels disturbed by this question. It's so clear. This also shows, this investigation, that the question of, me question of meaning is not an academic question. It is prevalent in population. And it is not, always, also not only prevalent in adult uh, population, it is prevalent in childhood. Children have an intuitive sensibility for the meaningful. Children show quite a resistance to doing meaningless things like homework or going to school <laughs> or claim for and claim for explanation when they should help in the kitchen. Why should I do that? What meaning does it have? It has more meaning to go to for a soccer play or for, for to play with other guys. In, in an empirical investigation which Debatz was making in Holland, he could show that in a number of 114 patients, those patients in a clinical uh, outpatient department who had a higher score of meaning showed a better well-being and a, a better outcome in psychotherapy. They suffered less from psychological stress, were happier, and had more self-esteem. So meaning is highly related to the, to the psychological health. And um, there are many, many investigations that show that. It is the positive attitude towards life and the understanding how I am embedded in life. Meaning, the search for meaning also has a social, sociological background. And I want to talk with you a little bit about the differentiation between meaning and uh, purpose. We are all children of our time, and we are living in a very purposeful time, where we look to be effective, and where we sometimes, for this attitude, lose our sense for meaning. We are probably living in a collective meaning crisis through by this um, purposefulness uh, which is leading our life in our civilization. This profit-oriented profit -oriented thinking uh, may lead to a collective misunderstanding of meaning. Meaning is often taken as a purpose Living a purposeful life does not mean to have found meaning. It is a functional life orientation around success. But success is not giving meaning. One can be very successful and rich and suffer from meaninglessness. Purpose. What are we doing when we live, when we realize a purpose? We are instrumentalizing oneself, ourselves, and the others. We make use of them for our own goals. Purpose, in purpose, we define the goal and look for the instrument to arrive there. Whatever helps to get there fulfills its purpose. 
If I want to hammer, for instance, a nail into the wall, a hammer or a stone or even the computer may do it. The purpose is fulfilled and the nail is in the wall. But if this nail in the wall has any meaning, it's a totally different question. The purpose is always a means to its end. which is defined by myself. The meaning, on the other hand, arises from the open dialogue, the interaction with the world. It is not constructed by myself. It does not depend from my goals. Meaning is the experience of the value of the situation. Meaning never subjects, but frees the values of both, the object and subject. The love of my parents, for instance, was meaningful to me when they loved me for my own sake and not for their purposes and plans. When they loved me unconditionally. My job has only meaning when I feel the value is related to my endeavors. This goes mostly together with the purpose of my job, accomplishing something, earning money. Most things have purpose and meaning at the same time. But the differentiation is subjectively important. A failure, for instance, destroys the purpose but not the meaning. If I am not successful, my endeavor can nevertheless have meaning for me. It was a worthy experience. It corresponded to me, it, I learned, etc. This is the meaning, but I was not successful. It goes like the Olympic motto. The Olympic motto says, to participate is all. We do not have to win, but to be there, frankly, openly, receiving the values and to respond to what is of value. And most often this goes together with purposes, but not always. To do something with love, for instance, is always meaningful, but not, or not, everything, not always purposeful. Living for purposes is quite narcissistic. It is a life which projects its goals and subdues the world and the others. One may be successful but lives a para-existential life in a constant danger of inner void. Leo Tolstoy describes this struggle with meaning and the attempt to replace its lack by purposes masterly in the novel Anna Karenina. I'm citing, when Levin was pondering on what he truly is, and why he was living at all, he found no answer and fell into despair. But when he stopped asking these questions about meaning, he was like knowing who he was and to what end he was living. He knew it simply because he lived purposefully, especially in the last time he was much more uh, energetic and dedicated than before. He could not behave otherwise than to do justice to the duties which attacked him from all sides. Levin was inspired by a juvenile idealism once he liked uh, to be willing to work for the whole humanity, but was stopped by the reality. So his ideal melted into a nothing. Since his marriage, he restricted himself more and more on a life for himself. All this besides the hunt and the beekeeping, newly brought into being, filled out Levin's life, which out of itself 
did not have the slightest meaning if he pondered on it. But he was highly occupied. So he lived without knowing who he really was and wherein consisted the meaning of his being and without the hope to attain this knowledge. His ignorance tortured him so much that he feared suicide. Simultaneously, he continued with absolute security his destinated way through life. One feels this, this crumbling ground and the inner void of living, don't you? No human being would suspect such an inner poverty behind this abundance of activity and varied, uh, varied life. The silent replace, replacement from this, of this the juvenile idealism through a stingy domesticity, through concentration on income and career, is not only Levin's dream, but also a problem of most youths and generations. So it, was, it can be a relief if the youth have uh, an ideology to follow because it is, it is taking away this burden of finding the own orientation in life. Meaning has a personal relevance. We can feel immediately the grip, the traction which uh, comes along with the meaning question when we ask ourselves what is giving meaning to my life? What makes it valuable? Do I feel the richness? of my life. What, may, what is making it so rich, so f rewarding? <coughs> and do I feel this? What am I living for? And looking better back on my life once I will probably ask myself, for what do I want to have lived for? For what, for what li did I live for? And now in the perspective way, for what do I want to have lived for once? That it was worth it to live. We can experience our life as meaningful and fulfilling only when we live it with inner consent. Only then I can really commit myself and give myself into my activities and relationships and receive in reaction to it fulfillment. It needs sometimes years to construct one's life in this sense and maybe, accomp and, and maybe accompanied by suffering, anxiety, farewells and changes to succeed in living with inner consent. When we see the possibilities in our life and commit ourselves to these possibilities, then we open rooms for existence. Possibilities that are of value are meanings. We come to this back. The practical part, let us start with the central attitude to the key for a fulfilled existence. The key is a phenomenological openness. Viktor Frankl was giving a general, uh, what was describing it in a general way and describes the attitudes towards the world, th this attitude which leads to meaning in the following way. We must perform a kind of Copernican revolution and give the question of the meaning of life an entirely new twist to it. It is life itself 
that asks question of man. It is not, not up to man to question, rather, he should recognize that he is questioned, questioned by life. He has to respond by being responsible, and he can answer to life only by answering for his life. So this means we can take our being here as, since we are spiritual beings with endowed with freedom, as being asked whatever is there is a question for me and is asking me for my answer. What am, how am I dealing with it? What am I doing it? How can I hmm, treat the situation in a way that there is a, a result which I appreciate, which I can feel in its value. This is my answer. And whatever I hear, whatever I am confronted with, can be taken as such a question. This uh, evening is such a question. What am I doing with it? And I am questioned if I want or not. Whatever is there is a question. Am I relating to it or not? Am I applying it or not? Am I using it or not? And how am I doing it? This is my duty. This is my duty. This is my possibility I have. I can use it or not. And even this is a decision. So the central key to find meaning is to open oneself to this being questioned, having a cancer, having a sickness, having suffering from a loss is a question. The question which goes at least in that way, what are you going to do with it? Deal with it. You cannot continue life avoiding what was imposing in your existence. Take your position. This be phenomenological openness needs dialogue, needs interchange. A dialogical exchange between oneself and the others. A double dialogue, a dialogue which addresses to the outside and a dialogue with myself in the inside. We have to let us reach by what is going on, by the beauty of the flowers and the uh, excitement of a dialogue with another person. When we get touched by it, then we can find out the essential, the essential of what is touching us and the essential which is in us. So it is always a, a double dialogue when I'm talking with someone, when I'm looking at the, at the stars or uh, to, to the trees and the, the nature, I have an inner talk with myself. This is the double reality, the double dialogue we are standing in. And this is the basis for finding meaning. If we are not open enough to our inner experience, then we cannot um, find meaning. For instance, um, I, I remember the, the therapy or the counseling with the Catholic priest. He was uh, in his 70s when he came into therapy. And um, he was suffering from a constant lack of meaning and a constant depressive depressive-like disorder. He has been checked several times by psychiatrists. They didn't define it as a real depression. He tried medication. It didn't help him really. And so he suffered for over 70 years, uh, for over 50 years, he was more than 70, uh, from this 
constant me feeling of meaninglessness. And this was a terrible situation for him because he was a priest and he should not suffer, he was supposed not to suffer from meaninglessness. So he couldn't talk about this with other people. He kept it secretly with him himself. He had a good friend, a nun, to her he was speaking newly just before he came in therapy and was talking about this. And this nun was in therapy with me. And she uh, sent him to me and finally he accepted to come. What happened? What was the case? The case was that in his youth he lost his mother when he was 14 years of age. And his mother was very, it was not, uh, his, was not very emotional. So he grew up with less, uh, with a, a lack of uh, love and, and, uh, uh, and bodily uh, uh, cherishing. He stood with his father. His father was a militant man has undergone a training in, in the army. And uh, it was the time when the Nazi, uh, when Austria was under the Nazi, uh, ruled by the Nazi. And um, at that time, with 15, he became a fanatic Hitlerian and went into the uh, Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth, and lived there happily until the end of the Second World War. This was the replacement of uh, his family. He had relationship, he felt cozy, he felt recept, uh, re received. And when the war was over, he fell into his first depression and since then he f suffered from meaninglessness. And in the search to overcome this meaninglessness, he, um, he had not a good relationship with his father. His father was too strong and too absent. In the search to overcome this meaninglessness, he studied theology against the will of, father, of the father. It was a rebellion against the father also. And he became a priest and he became a very good and highly respected priest, suffering the whole life. The meaninglessness endured, uh, or prevailed continued. And then when he came, I was asking him how he could, if he has any explanation about, ex explication of, of what is going on in him. And he said, no, he doesn't. He tried everything rationally, cognitively, philosophically, theologically. He was praying more and nothing helped. Not even psychiatry couldn't help could help. We started therapy, which lasted only four hours. Um, by turning toward the early loss of his mother. And I was saying him that, uh, asking him if he ever was mourning about this early loss. And he said, well, not really, but now it's over so many decades. And if he was, suff if he was mourning about uh, his mother's emotional stiffness, he said, no, the, it was a difficult life situation, but then I overcame it in the Nazi uh, Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth. And he was always putting the the upcoming emotions underneath the reason. The intellect was more important for him. Emotions made him kind of helpless. The feeling of a lack of meaning showed him to him that the direction of his life was not totally correct, that something very important was missing. This was not a good way to repress emotion in such a way. 
And for the first time in his life, he allowed himself to cry about his parents, about both. But he did it alone, not in the session with me. He lived alone for the whole life. He was not able to share that. But he did not need to share it with me. But he did it. And this glacier ice was melting. Old suffering came up about his relationship to his parents. But it was freeing him. And the feeling of a lack of meaning was melted away. And in the fifth session, which we have uh, scheduled, he didn't come. He was calling after a month. Uh, we scheduled the next session because he, he was improving considerably. He was calling and saying, in the last month, I didn't have a single experience of meaninglessness and no symptoms of any kind of depression. This is a way, and I don't see a reason why I should come. And I said, it's OK. It's very good. You are he was open to what is, was coming up within himself. And the sense of the, the feeling of meaninglessness shows us when that life doesn't have a good direction. Something is missing. A mourning, a relationship. It can be different, different things. Things of value are missing in our life. Then, as a result, meaninglessness is appearing. Let's see some practical steps to come to the inner, uh, to, to, to meaning, some more practical steps. We were talking about this uh, inner dialogue, this double dialogue. And this double dialogue um, may result in uh, should result in something which is the turning point in the meaning searching process. When we can live with inner consent to what we are doing, then we are participating actively in what uh, we see as meaningful. We can give our inner consent only when what we are doing has meaning, has subjectively felt meaning. It need not be an objective meaning. It need not be the case that others say, others say this is meaningful. The important thing is that we can give our consent. Consent in that meaning, in, in, in that sense that we say yes, yes to what I am doing. Yes to what I am deciding. Well, this is the shortest description of existential life. In to live with inner consent. The practical steps uh, to find inner consent shows that there are four fundamental realities we have to deal with. I will talk about this in the next 15 minutes then this will be the end of the presentation. Is that OK, 15 minutes more, or is it already too much? So we, we try. And you gave me your consent. Thank you. <laughs> so this means you are present. The first step is harmonizing with reality. Existence, meaningful existence is built on truth, on reality, not on illusions, not on fantasy, not on dreams. It must be built in this world. We need, for this, we need a lot of protection and support to be able to accept what is there sometimes. The central question of this um, endeavor to deal with reality is the question, what can I do? What is possible for me? What abilities do I have amongst 
the facts in this given reality. Meaningful is only existentially meaningful, can be only something which is really, be fe really feasible for me. What I can really do, where I feel that I have an ability to do. So it is, um, it is related to my own power and to my own concrete and situational being here. This connection to reality um, leads to acceptance. When I accept what is here, this connects me to reality. This is the way to put it. And this needs and provides trust. Trust means what is there, I, I rely on it. I put myself on it. I trust this ground that it holds me. I trust you. The in, I feel secure here because I trust you that you don't kill me. I trust in the relationship. Trust always means that there is enough reality which can hold me, which can contain me, which can support me. Trust is very basic in life and we trust continuously every day. But the capacity to trust, to trust is related to the fact that um, I, must, I must have a, a power. A, the capacity is grown through our life and is based on a basic, a fundamental trust. And this is a spiritual dimension in life. We have a deep feeling of being whole in life when we have fundamental trust. We have a deep feeling gained through experience that we are hold by a system of, of, of facts that even if we die, we are in a, in a cosmos in an order that it has its rules when we have fundamental trust. It has a deeper sense, it has a deeper grounding which we feel in fundamental trust. It is the ground of being which we can feel ultimately in every single situation where we, where we trust we relate to the deepest structure, which is a spiritual dimension. This irrational, emotional perception that I am whole, ultimately. And this is before every kind of religion. This is something we experience, children experience it are experiencing it, starting from the, from the beginning, from the first year of life. And it is growing and, and changing throughout our life, through all the experiences we have, all the experiences of which uh, lead to a good experience of trust is nourishing this fundamental trust. And it's telling me, look at that. You are hold by a bigger earth. You are hold by a bigger cosmos. You are hold by a bigger regularity, by laws. You do not fall out from this earth. You are being kept. And this is through the psychological dimension we can reach until this depth, and it is there, it is like the groundwater which allows the plants to, to grow. This, this groundwater allows our everyday hope and trust to flourish. 
there is a deep dimension underneath all of these four dimensions on which is built our existence and meaning. The second dimension, the second reality we have to deal with by finding meaning is uh, that we need emotions and relationship. It is not suffici uh, sufficient to perceive facts and to, to count realities and measure it and weigh it. If we don't feel it, we um, are not nurtured. The question which is going with it is, do I like what I do? When I want to find meaning, first we look at the reality. Can I do it? Then we look at our emotions. Do I like what I do? Things which I don't like will not turn out to be meaningful. And to find out what I like, I have to turn to my emotions. And in emotions, emotions come up through relationships. Only through relating, I get this connection to life. With emotions come along, comes along the feeling of life. When I ask myself, where am I really living? Or when did I really experience life? Then it is certainly uh, a, an, emo an emotional situation. Love, or dancing, or laughing or, or e experiencing the body by sport or sexuality or whatever. It is, the, the connection uh, is done, the connection to life is going over emotion. And this, to bring in emotions, this needs closeness. Closeness to experience emotion, only through closeness we come to an emotion, closeness, in closeness we get touched. We get the feeling. The physical closeness, of course, produces feeling. But also the spiritual and psychological closeness. When we open ourselves and let come in the music, then we open closeness, then we, we provide closeness to the music and get touched. And this provides feeling. The spiritual dimension is that we, behind every experience of value, emotionally felt value through relationship, value of a good music, of a good meal, of a good um, dialogue, an encounter. Every experienced dialogue, uh, experienced value, is a signal of the value of life itself. In the depths behind every experience of value, we find, we, we get the notion that life itself, prob probably, possibly, has a value. That it is valuable to be alive. We have a deep inner notion, a feeling, mostly unconscious. If it is, if my life has value or not, or may have value, maybe at the moment it doesn't have enough value, but it is of that order that it can have value. We feel that, and we know it we have it in our feeling by the manifold experiences we made throughout life. When we experience something good, this tells me, look at that, life can be good. And when we experience something bad, then we get the notion, life can be bad. And so we have to look what is prevailing in our life. 
For depressive persons, it is prevailing the negative experience of life. Life is not good. It's not good that I'm alive. This is a depressive feeling. The depressive has a lack of experience of values. When it is the contrary, when the, the, it is the case the contrary, then I have the deep feeling, well, I, am, I feel gratitude that I can live. To feel gratitude is a spiritual attitude that I can live. Because it is, in itself, it is good. My experience of life shows that despite of all suffering and losses, it has its value to be alive, and I feel it personally. This is a deep attachment to life. Going through emotions, relationship, experiences of closeness, which show me, which brings into my feelings the values, and each single experience of something good tells me that life in itself has a value, or not. It is open. Everyone has to make his own experience, or his or her own, own experience. Like in the first dimension of reality, the spiritual dimension lies in the feeling of astonishment. Wow, there is a world and I am there. I can't understand it. This is a fact. This is not the relationship to life like it is here the case. It is the relationship to, to, to the world. And the feeling of astonishment, how can it be, is a, a spiritual experience. So, the search for meaning starts with reality and what I can do. The spiritual dimension behind is astonishment. The search for meaning continues by having a look to our emotions, to what I like or not, to what is good and what is bad, and to orient ourselves after that what is good. The spiritual dimension behind is the feeling of gratitude. When I feel gratitude, I have a positive experience of the depth behind the single experience of value. The third reality we have to deal with is that I am a person and I am myself. And I make decisions, and the decisions I make are my decisions, and not yours. And you cannot make my decisions. I'm unique in that. And I identify with myself. So this third element, which is basic for finding meaning, is I have to take, to, to, I have to have I have to have a look on myself. It's me who makes the decision. And I have to make the decisions in a way that I can identify myself. And therefore, I, the question is, is this correct what I do? Is it mine? Only then I can identify myself in it. And this gives me self-esteem and the feeling of, I'm doing just. Is this correct? Is this mine? We need encounter with other people to be able to connect to ourselves. Only through the you I can be me. And encounter needs appreciation of the other. 
and gives appreciation to me. Appreciation is a basic in meaning. In appreciation we relate to the uniqueness and to the unmistakability. It allows authenticity to come up and gives a correspondence to my inner feelings. Through appreciation, we have a connection to the own, to that, to the own self of the other and of myself. The spiritual dimension in it is the person and the moral conscience. Within me, in my uniqueness, somebody starts talking. And when I'm talking, it's somebody who talks through me, my person. I am my person, which is, I don't, I cannot define it. I cannot determine it. It is free. It is that what starts talking when I'm walking through a, through a wood and suddenly it comes up to me how wonderful it is here, the tree, the air, that movement, that silence. And it starts talking within me. This is my person. Or when I do something and it starts talking in within me, talking, uh, we take it uh, as an image. It's not a real voice, but it is like a voice. It starts talking, oh, that's, that's interesting what you are doing, or this is not so well. I get a, an awkward feeling in, in my stomach. Uh, what am I doing here? So this is my person, which is showing up through my moral conscience, for instance, which gives me way to what I do or which, which tries to inhibit me to continue. This is free within me and it sometimes comes across my plans or across my, my rationality. This is also a very important element in finding meaning and this is the, this depth of being unique, of being myself, of having a self, this um, depth of authenticity is me as a person, as an unconditional person, as a, which has a moral conscience, a moral conscience like a compass uh, which shows me where to go which is the right, the correct direction. A direction which leads to a good end. So, meaning also encompasses this really intuitive inner perception. This connection to, my, to myself. And this be because we are persons and have moral conscience. This provides us dignity. Human dignity is founded in this being a person, in this unconditional capacity, which is arising in ourselves, and sometimes we don't even know that we have it, that we are Sometimes we are surprised of what is coming up and what is starting to talk within us. A meaningful existence, a fulfilling existence, needs to see it in a greater horizon. The greater horizon starts with the question, for what is it good? This is the pointing towards the context in which it is happening, what I do, 
and the future. It is good maybe for my family. This is a context where I'm in. It is good maybe for patients when I'm working in a hospital. This is the context, the greater context. Within it, I'm putting myself. I'm putting myself into a greater value, horizon of value, and opening a future. We have to transcend ourselves if we want to, fin to find fulfillment and to be fruitful. It is a deep desire of human beings to be fruitful, not only on a biological basis, but also on a spiritual basis. We want to be good for something or somebody, not only for ourselves. We want, we have the desire to transcend ourselves onto anathemas. Otherwise, we would live as if in a house where nobody ever visits. This is emptiness. This is existential vacuum. Everything is there, but it's not used. Nobody is coming. We want to share what we have. So the question is, I am there. I am living. But for what is it good? To what end is it good? What, where does it lead to? Where are the fruits? If I have nothing that needs me or waits for me, I have a feeling of emptiness, frustration, even despair, and frequently addiction. This is the basis for addiction. But if I have something to live for, I can live with dedication and action, and finally, of my own form of religious belief. The sum of these experiences add up to the meaning of life and leads to a sense of fulfillment. How can we connect to meaning? We can connect to meaning by putting ourselves into concordance to what is there, to values outside. To put myself into concordance to what is moving me, what is reaching me, what is touching me, what is felt of being valuable, important. And if I see that it has correspondence to myself and go this way, then I'm putting myself into this greater horizon. And this needs, and pro needs activity. Let us take it, this abstract element into a more concrete level. Existential meaning is defined as the most valuable, realistic possibility of the given situation for which I feel I should decide myself. Existential meaning, therefore, is the possible here and now. The most valuable possibility. Maybe this evening, the most possible most valuable possibility was to come here, but maybe there was another possibility which was more valuable. Before we are coming here, we can't be for sure. Maybe some of you are deceived of this evening and are saying, well, it would have been better to stay at home or to see a friend. We can't know it for sure at the beginning. This is the existential risk we have to deal with. This is how we get into concordance. And out from this concordance, we decide, and if we decide for the most valuable or best, probably, hopefully, best possibility, then we fulfill meaning. 
we follow a meaningful life. Possibility of the given situation. This is for this hour, for the next hour. Then there are other possibilities and we have to decide again and again and find meaning for every hour, for 20 times a day, 50 times a day, 100 times a day. And we are have always the feeling if this possibility is really a worthful one or not. And there's when it is a worthful one, we are on the right direction. We can continue. As long as there is coming up another situation which claims for another, or brings up another possibility which maybe is better, or which maybe is now time for it. Going to bed, for instance, may be a good possibility at 11 o'clock in the evening. And now it would be, would lead to miss something a chance which I have to read a book or to do something else. The best possibility in every situation, this is existential meaning. To make the best of it, this was the term Frankl was like, uh, like to use, to make the best of every situation. The best which is realistic, the best which is felt, the best which is decided by myself, by my authentic experience. That I see that this is correct, that this is leads to a good end. And the best which is in the horizon of the context in which I am seeing it. Meaning needs a field of activity. Frankl was describing the main roads to existential meaning. He was saying we can find three roads which lead to meaning. These three roads cover all the possibility to find existential meaning. And he was describing not processes but categories, areas. He was saying, go to West, there is the experiential value. Experience something valuable. A good movie, reading a book, having a talk, chatting, whatever you feel is realistic, you feel as valuable, and you see that it corresponds to your own. The second category is, are the creative values. This means do something which is of value. Cook, write a, an email, talk with your child, with your partner. Do something of value, very practical. <coughs> this is meaning. And if both are not possible, there is a category we have to learn, a category which is the most difficult category to find meaning, attitudinal values. When there is nothing to enjoy and nothing positively to do, when we are too sick, when we are too reduced, too depressive, whatever, too resignated, then we can realize meaning by taking over an attitude which reduces the negative. An attitude which at least allows me that I can look into my eyes and say, well, I didn't give me up. I didn't give up my relationship to life. I was uh, honest, truthful, open, relational to my life. When I'm very sick or when I'm coming close to die, that I undergo this situation in a way that I feel identic to myself and to my way of living and to my hmm, most important 
convictions and values and beliefs. This is a very intimate activity. It is not passing in the world. It is deep inside. It is a very spiritual and deep dimension where we fulfill meaning. There is another meaning, the meaning at the beginning we were talking about this meaning which is, da which is um, treated by philosophy and religion. The overall meaning for what something is created, this meaning does not depend from ourselves. Why are we on this earth? Why is there an, a world? We don't know. We have no knowledge about it. Religion are talking. Religions are talking about it. But, and philosophy is speculating about it. But natural science has no answer to that. Psychology has no answer to that. Theology, yes. So we must have a clear distinction which part of meaning belongs to psychology and which part doesn't. And it was Frankl's, uh, 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 the spiritual, this, uh, sorry about this, um, the ontological meaning, the meaning of, uh, of existence, the meaning of something which is there, this is the, the, the deepest ontological, uh, the, the deepest spiritual dimension in the meaning searching process that we feel deeply, as it was the case in every of the four fundamental um, elements of meaning, we also feel deeply if my life at all probably has meaning. I, I can't denominate it concretely. I can't tell it is this or that. It is surpassing me, but I can touch it by intuition and have a feeling that my life possibly has meaning and I'm contributing to it by my existential activities and existential meaning. But above this, it may have meaning that I'm on the earth or not. But this is a belief. This is a real spiritual dimension. Let's summarize. Meaning is based on reality, on life, on being a person, and on the openness to a future. And we, the activity is to reality, what's reality? A trust, until the fundamental trust, the closeness to life. The person is reached by appreciation, encounter but appreciating encounter. And future is open through activity. And the spirituality, the relationship of meaning with spirituality, it is astonishment on reality. Wow. How is it possible that I exist? Did you ever have thoughts like this? Or the gratitude for life that I live, experience, feel. I'm so grateful that this is possible. This is the spiritual um, vinculation. The dignity of persons. As a person, I am untouchable. I have to respect myself and others. I have also have to have a respect for myself, what is coming up as an inner voice, and how you decide. This is also something which I have to respect because it's you, and you are your own entity. And finally, the meaning of being in general, which is something we didn't make, 
We cannot know. We can sense. I want to close with a, a sentence of Viktor Frankl, summing up most of that what we are talking about. He once was saying, with this attitude of freedom of the person, of this spiritual view on, the, on life, he was saying, life is not anything. Life is the chance for something. It depends on us. And it depends on our capacity, our taking seriously, taking serious this capacity to rely on reali reality, to feel the quality of life, to encounter the uniqueness of others and take seriously the only, serious, the only uniqueness and to put ourselves into a broader horizon in a context where I can live a dedication in my life and thus fulfill my own existence. Thank you very much for listening.